Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to the Garden of Peace Worship Center Bible Study on this Wednesday. Hope everyone having a great Wednesday. Uh, I am, and uh, hope all is well with you and your family. Hope you, as you get to hump day, hopefully you're, you're looking uh, well uh, as the rest of the week is on the way and your weekend is shortly to come. So, amen. I'm excited uh, about today's lesson because today's lesson uh, is talking about growing in faith like Abraham did. Growing in faith, faith like Abraham did. And we're going to be coming from Romans 4 and also we're going to be coming from Psalm uh, 42. Actually, 43. Uh, and uh, we're going to go through this. We're going to have a word of prayer. Precious God and Father, we thank you. We bless you. We magnify you, Lord. We thank you for all your bountiful blessings. We thank you that we take it one day at a time. Sweet Jesus. That's all we're asking of you. Hallelujah. It's one day at a time, Lord. We thank you for today's blessings. We thank you for today's uh, 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 overwhelming joy. We thank you for today's mercies. We thank you for today. Hallelujah. We give you glory for today. Lord, we know tomorrow is not promised, but even so, we thank you for this day. Uh, this is the day the Lord has made, and I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. So, amen. We're going to give glory to God. Uh, as I posted on, on Facebook, I think a lot of people know uh, this week, actually Sunday, uh, four years ago, I had my quadruple heart bypass surgery, and uh, my daughter told me today, and I thought it was really something. It just gave me another reason uh, to be thankful, and she talked with a young lady whose mom had the same surgery, and uh, she didn't make it. And, uh, of course, I know a few other people that have had that surgery, and they uh, end up passing away on the table. And so it just, again, makes you thankful uh, to God. Uh, eight hours uh, of surgery and uh, touch and go at certain times. Didn't know whether I would be here or not, but God is faithful. God is good all the time. And so I'm happy that I'm here, thankful to the Lord. I guess he had more for me to do, and uh, I don't have a problem with that. So uh, as I said, we're going to go to Romans. And we're going to talk about growing in faith, amen, as Abraham did. And that starts in Romans 4. Romans 4, amen. Romans 4, awesome chapter. Awesome chapter. Uh, we're going to actually start at verse number 18. But even before that, I, I just want to say we're going to start a little before that. Uh, uh, because what, I like what the Apostle Paul says at the beginning. Because so many times we get caught up, and I believe in living holy. I believe in living a righteous life. I believe in showing, letting our light shine before men that they may glorify God in us. I believe in that. But I want, uh, and I understand, and I want people to understand that that is not going to get you to heaven. Only the grace of God, only the righteousness of God is what's going to get us to heaven. Amen. It's not what we do. It's what he has already done when he died on Calvary. Because the Bible, and I say this over and over and over again, the Word of God says that we are as filthy rags is our righteousness. Uh, in this same book, the book of Romans, he says, For there's none good, no, not one. So I can't look at you and say, Well, I'm not like you, I'm better off and all that, because that's not the way God looks at it. Because God looks at us all the same. And amen. He looks at, okay, you were a murderer. You were a killer. You were, you know, you were a robber. All that. All of it is clumped into one category. And that is we all need Christ. We all need salvation. And that's why he said that. There's none righteous. No, not one. Hallelujah. And uh, that's it. Yeah, I like that. Actually, that's in chapter Romans chapter 3. We're dealing with Romans chapter 4, but chapter 3, uh, he says in verse number 9, 
He said, what then? Are we better than they? Look at that. See, am I better than you? Because, you know, you're, you're, you're way over there. You spent 100 years in prison. Am I better than you? Because I spent five, you know? No. Uh, amen. No. He says, no way. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, hallelujah. Doesn't matter where you come from. Doesn't matter what part, uh, what, whether you come from across the tracks, on the tracks, in the tracks, around the tracks. None of that matters. He says here, he says, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. <laughs> we all under it. Hallelujah. We all understand. We all done wrong. We all have made mistakes. We all. So nobody's better than the other one. Then he goes on to say in verse 10, he said, as it is written, there is none righteous. Oh, glory. Glory. Right there, we can stop. We can stop. You see, I can stop trying to uh, lord over you and, and you lording over me. And we hollering, well, at least I wasn't that bad. And at least I'm not, you know, you know how we do, you know, church folk. You know, we, well, honey, I wasn't, at least I wasn't that, you know. And she was a prostitute and she was this. And her, he was that and that and the other. And here is God Almighty speaking through the prophet and apostle Paul. And he's saying, hallelujah, he says, there's none righteous. No, not one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, there's none that doeth good. No, not one. They are all going out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. That's what the apostle Paul says. Chapter three, verse number 10. He said, there's none that understand it. There's none that seeketh after God. God sought after you. You didn't go seeking after God. Hallelujah. He sought after you. Glory. Hallelujah. I know sometimes we think, well, I decided. No, you didn't decide anything. The Spirit drew you, drew you. Jesus said, no man cometh unto me except the Father draw him. Hallelujah. You were drawn to Christ. Circumstances in your life, things might have happened. There are things that happened in my life, amen, that drew me to God. You know, they were things, amen, things, you know, when they start talking about putting you away and all kind of stuff like that, those things can draw you. <laughs> Glory to God. They can draw you to God. So, amen, he drew us. We didn't just decide, I'm, I think I'm going to go to church or I think I need. Now, if you thought you needed to go to church, amen, the Lord put the thought in your mind. The Lord put the thought in your heart. Hallelujah. That's what happened. See, he put it in you to go to church. All of us, I mean, out of the blue, all of a sudden they say, you know what? I need to get myself together. That comes from God. That's not something you came up with. That is God's spirit speaking to you. Amen. All of a sudden, out of the blue, you just decide, you know, I got to get my life together. I got to get myself together. Man, I don't like the way I'm going. Man, I'm going to end up dead. Man, I'm going to end all of these things. These things, God begins to draw you by his spirit. His spirit draws you. Amen. And you begin all of a sudden, a small spiritual understanding comes to you. And you begin to understand, I need to change. Hallelujah. I need to walk different. I need to talk different. You know what? I need to do. I need, you know what's so important? I mean, it's not even about all that. It's about I need purpose in my life. I need purpose. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you've been through some of the things that some of you have been through, you have purpose. You need to tell your story. Tell your story. Yes, you may not become a multi-multi-millionaire, but you have a multi-million dollar story. Hallelujah. You have that. Glory to God. You have it. Hallelujah. You have a million dollar story of what God has done in your life. How God changed you. How God brought you up out of a horrible pit. How he brought you up out of the muck and the mire. How he brought you, amen, from all of the things that you were involved in, whatever they may have been. You have a testimony of what God has done. And you know what? Somebody needs to hear it. Amen. Somebody needs to hear it. I was an angry man. My daddy left me. My, you know, my, I didn't have nobody with me. I didn't have a male figure to look up to. You know, my mother was on drugs. I mean, all these things that we today, amen, especially the younger generation, have testimonies of. 
most of us older, you know, uh, we had two parents in the home a lot of times and things like that. But the younger generation, you know, may, some don't know their father, don't know. Amen. Some's mother's been in prison and, you know, and father is in prison and all these kind of things. So you have and now you are saved and now you are sanctified and now you're filled with the Holy Ghost. You have a testimony. You can glorify God. And that young man who's growing up around you, amen, whose father is not in the home, whose mother may not be in the home, who has been, amen, in the system, amen, who is now under foster care and all of these things that they're having to deal with. And amen, they see somebody, oh, glory to God. They see somebody that's living a little different, somebody that's walking a little different, somebody with some compassion, hallelujah, that says, this person cares about somebody, cares about me. That's what wins people to God. That's why he told me, by this shall all men know you are my disciples that you love. And love is an action word. Hallelujah. Pistis is the word faith. Love is the word of Gapow. Hallelujah. It is and it's something you do. It's not something you talk about. Usually when people do a lot of talking, they're not doing anything. I learned that. I tell you, y'all that's on Facebook, we all should know that. That anytime a person speaks about the same thing all the time and what they're doing and da 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 a lot of times they're not doing anything. I, I, I didn't even charge you for that. I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. He says now, he says, look, he says, uh, verse 12, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. And the poison of ass, the poison of snakes is what he's saying. The poison of snakes is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their way, and the way of peace have they not known. He's talking about each and every one of us before we knew God, before we were converted, before we were, amen, saved by the power of God. This is the situation we were in, and so we cannot look down. It's amazing to me that many of us were in horrible situations and we got saved and we got beautifully saved and some of us are in ministry and some of us, amen, are deacons and some of us, I mean, are really serving God. And many times we will have the audacity, and I'm saying that, talking about myself as well, the audacity to look down on somebody else because they're struggling. Hallelujah, that doesn't even know the Lord. And we would look down on them and, you know, and, and, and look, uh, like, I mean, look in that downward like, you know, <clears throat> that you're superior in some way. And you're not superior. You, amen, have been saved by God. You have been gifted by God. You have been strengthened by God. Amen. All of these things came from God. He gave it to you freely. Hallelujah. The scripture says in Corinthians, Paul said to him, he said, what do you have that you did not receive? How can you gloat like you've done so much when God gave you everything that you have? And that's the same thing he gave us, salvation. David said, what shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits? He couldn't think of what could he render. All he could say is, I'll take the cup of salvation. In other words, hallelujah, I will allow God to work in my life. I can't render anything to him. I can't add anything to God, but I can be thankful to God. I can glorify him in my body and in my heart and in my mind. I can glorify him in my actions and in my walk and in my talk. Hallelujah. That's what I render to the Lord. I glorify him. Hallelujah. I cannot talk about how great I am. I cannot. See, God told David. He told David, he said, I made you great. He said, you were out there among the sheep. You were out there doing, you know, just taking care of the sheep. You were such in such a condition that when the man of God, Samuel, came and was going to anoint the new king, he went through six of your brothers 
And he said, God haven't anointed any of these. Do you have any more children? Your father didn't even think about you. That's what kind of state you were in. Your own father didn't even, he ran six brothers by the prophet Samuel, but he didn't go get you. I'm talking about what God does in our lives. So we're thankful to God. Hallelujah. We bless him. We magnify him. Oh, I heard my, you know, I wasn't at church Sunday, but I heard the, the praises going up. Amen. I watched them as the praises went up and we were glorifying God and I was glorifying him right with you because when the praises go up, hey, glory, the blessings come down. When we honor him, when we glorify him, woo -wee, he just don't know. Hallelujah. You got to be thankful. You got to think back. When I think back over my life, hallelujah, I mean, I have to say I have a testimony. I didn't do it myself. I didn't work it out myself. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. God be the glory. God be the glory. God be the glory. Ah, blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I feel like praising God. Hallelujah. For all of his benefits. For all that he has done. For all. Hallelujah. God is so good. Woo. Even when I'm down, he's good. When I'm up, he's good. Hallelujah. When I'm level with the ground, he's good. Woo. Paul said, I find in whatsoever state I am in, I learn to be content because God is on my side. My goodness, and when God is on your side, it's going to work out for you. You have scriptures that tell you all things work together for good to them that love the Lord to call according to his purpose. You don't have to worry. I don't know. It's working for your good. It's working for your good. It's working for your good good because God said so. Romans 8 28 he said is working for your good. Now if I believe the word of God I don't care what my situation is. I don't care what I'm dealing with. I don't care what I'm going through. It's still working for my good. And that's what's powerful. And that's what's leading us into Romans 4 where we're talking about having the faith that Abraham had because even though things were happening in his life, even though God, see, and one thing about God, he'll make a promise to you and then, oh, look like the bow breaks. <laughs> he'll make a promise to you that he's going to do something in your life and all oh, looks like, I mean, every demon in hell is loosed against you. And you know what? It probably is. Because God now, after he's made the promise, he wants you to cling to that promise until he brings it to pass. Because that is what faith is all about. I cling and hold on like Abraham. It said he, oh, he did not waver. You know, he was strong in faith. And that's where we're at. We're in Romans 4. We were just talking in Romans 3 at that time. But we're in Romans 4 where we're talking about the faith of Abraham. Paul tells us that Abraham grew strong in faith. Hallelujah. And that's what we should do. First chapter of Romans said we go from faith to faith. G uh, 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 David said we go from strength to strength in Zion. See, every test that you deal with strengthens you if you hold on. If you hold on, it strengthens you. Hallelujah. You made it over one mountain. I always say this, and I, you know, sometimes you find yourself repetitive, you know, but God is repetitive. Why you think that, I mean, constantly, all through the Old Testament, he would tell Israel, I am the God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. How many, how many times, if you ever look, how many times did God say that? He said it a lot of times, because you have to be, it has to be reemphasized, reemphasized. And what I'm saying is that it had to be reemphasized you know, about what Abraham, the faith that he had, the walk that he had with God. 
Paul talks about it a whole lot. Different books, the different people. He talks about the faith of Abraham. Abraham he said, believe God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. He believed God. That's what I said. He believed God. We go from faith to faith. Strength to strength. We believe God. We go from mountain to mountain. Stepping stone to stepping stone. Higher and higher. Every time I go through something, I look back and thank God. And then my faith has grown. My faith has increased. So now I can bless you. Because my faith says God can do it. So when somebody says, man, I got high blood pressure, man, I got lupus, man, whatever they may say, I can say God is able to heal, to deliver. I've been through it. It was, un it was unbelievable to me. Uh, and, and my son got up one time in service. I never forget this because I'd never heard that before. And he said, well, you know, my dad's had a lot of surgeries. And I remember, you know, I have, <laughs> you know, but every time God brought me out of them, you know, he brought me out of, them. you know, there was a time I couldn't walk, couldn't walk. You know, there was three, they were kids, they were kids. I couldn't get around three years. I was out of church because I couldn't get to the church. I couldn't walk, you know, and, uh, but I tell you, I took the word of God. That Solomon, when he was de dedicating the temple, he said, Lord, if your people are in a foreign country and they just look to the temple, he said, Lord, hear them. And I took that word. Yes, I, wa I, wasn't, I wasn't in a foreign country, but I took that word and I applied it to myself and said, Lord, I'm going to one day get back to Greater Bethany. One day I'm going to be back in the church. One day I'm back in the, amen, in the temple. Hallelujah. And that day came. And I tell you what's so powerful. Oh, my God. My God. Let me tell you what's so powerful about God. I didn't, when I got back to the church, I didn't have to start over. Because I had been missing three years. Usually, you know, you sit on, and that's what I was going to do, sit on the back, back, you know, I had been in the ministry already, I was going to sit in the back, and amen, I was just going, okay, hallelujah, you know, Lord, let me be a blessing wherever I can, and I mean, God bless me, I came right back, and moved right back in, God exalted me right away, you know, and I told one brother, said, I need you to be my assistant, I said, man, I just got back, I said, you need to run that by the bishop, brother, I don't, you know, I'm not going to do that if God is not the one behind it. I'm telling you, I had people that were jealous, and I'm going to drop that because I don't want people to get the wrong idea and think I'm gloating over myself. I'm talking about what God can do. I'm talking about what God did in my life. I'm not talking about me, you know, per se. I'm talking about what the Lord can do. So, amen, amen. But I know what he can do, and you can't take that. See, one thing about God, when God does something in your life, people can't take that from you. You know, they can say what they want to. They can doubt what you say. They can say, nah, that never happened. I don't believe that. You know, they can say, oh, I mean, again, right here in this book, chapter number three, I like what he says. Listen what he says. Chapter number three in the book of Romans, he said, what advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of being a Jew or circumcision, he calls it. He said, much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Okay? But he said, for what if some did not believe? People don't believe your testimony. People don't believe God did it for you. People don't, ah, man, you crazy. I don't believe all that stuff. He says, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God? I love this scripture. Shall their unbelief make the faith of God, amen, without effect? <laughs> Look at what Paul says. <laughs> God forbid. Nobody care what they believe about what God has done for you. They going to doubt you. That's all right. I know what God did for me. I know where he brought me from. I know, hallelujah, what he's done in my life. It doesn't matter what you believe about what God has done for me. 
He said, God forbid, yea, let God be true and every man a liar. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at what he says. He says, verse 4, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. <laughs> See, yeah. let God be true. If God did it for you, he did it for you. I'm not going to denounce that. I'm not going to let anybody else denounce it. God brought you out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. God brought you out. Hallelujah. God saved you. God delivered you. You had different uh, habits and different addictions and all these things, and God delivered you. Why would I? I don't believe the Lord did that. I don't believe, you know, I'm, huh? Uh-uh. I believe. And you don't ever slight your own testimony. You know what God did for you. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what other people believe. That's their problem. Yay, let God be true. And every man a liar. Hallelujah. And that's the way I take it. God is true. Bible said, for Abraham believed God, and it was appointed unto him. For righteousness. Hallelujah. He stuck with God. He stood on something that did not seem real. See? And it doesn't matter. I was just saying a minute ago. doesn't matter. David was so low on the totem pole, his daddy didn't even go get him. <laughs> daddy, you know, and, and if you're feeling in, in, insignificant, if you're feeling like, you know, people don't think nothing about me, honey, God does. Because while they looked at David as not significant, God knew who he was, and God chose him. They let six brothers, I know I said this, but I got to say it again. They let six brothers pass by Samuel the prophet. And he said, none of these people is the one that God said is going to be the next king. He said, do you have any more sons? Jesse, probably, I'm, I'm, I'm of course now, you know, doing my thing, and he probably sat back and said, well, you know, I do have another son, but he ain't, you know, I know you're not talking about him. Yep, that people tried to count you out. <laughs> they tried to count me out quite a few times. But see, God continues to be faithful when people try to count you out. Hallelujah. He's still faithful. When people say you can't make it, when people say, how you think you can do that, God is still faithful. Hallelujah. God said you can do it. So they send for David. And David walks in the door and Samuel says, this is him. This is the Lord's anointed right here. This is the one that God is calling. All of his brothers, his daddy, and whoever probably else was in the house didn't even think about him. But God thought about him. And that's what's so, uh -uh, so powerful about you about your testimony, is God thought about you. doesn't matter what other people say. doesn't matter what others say, you know, you did or you didn't do or whatever. All you do is give God the glory. Give him the honor. Hallelujah. God, he, we just read it. It said, God forbid, yea, let God be true and let every man be a liar. If God did it, he did it in your life. If God saved you, they can say what they want to. They can say you just changed your life. You just thought better about yourself. They can say whatever they want to say. You know what the Lord has done for you. And you have a testimony. And when you have a testimony, you can't steal. See, you can't steal my joy because I have a testimony. I know what God has done for me. I know how God has, I'm sitting on the, ta sitting at the table, me and my wife and the kids, no food, and get a ring at the door, and all of a sudden, well, it wasn't a ring at the door, what it was was that I, I saw the mailman had come, I said, oh man, you know, I went and checked the mailbox, and there's a $500 check in the mailbox, we sitting right, getting ready to sit around and try to figure out what we going to eat. I know what God can do. I know he's done it. And I've heard the testimonies of others about what he has done. So I'm, I'm past that. I went from faith to faith. So I moved on from that. I'm believing God for bigger things now. I'm believing God for some mega stuff now. I'm believing, because see, I, I believed him to, to heal that headache. 
I believed him to heal that toothache. I believed him, you know, to heal my leg hurting. But now, you know, you can believe him for cancer. You can believe him for lupus. You can believe him for diabetes and all these things. See, you go from faith to faith. He keeps stepping. He said they go, David said they go from strength to strength in Zion. And that's what Abraham did. God called Abraham, told him, get out of your family's house. Get away from, see, it, you know, we, we, we see it on Facebook all the time. We see it all the time. But it is a true statement. I, I think Dr. McBride actually talked about it last week, but I'm going to go back to uh, Genesis uh, chapter 12 because it is important. It is important because people can infect your testimony. People can, because you get around those people uh, and, and, and then they knock you down. And I, you know, one thing I've never understood is that so many times uh, when people, of, people of, of God get around sinners, instead of making the sinners act like us, we act like them. And I, and I, I try to understand that. You know, uh, because we're supposed to infect the world with the word of God, infect them with love and kindness, hallelujah, and with the power of God in our lives. And it seems like they're so easily to infect us with stupid stuff, with stuff we've quit doing, with stuff that we've left behind, as he says, you know, moving past the principles of the faith. You know, let us go on to maturity. Let us go on to perfection. Let us go on. Amen. Not talking about baptism no more. We've done that. Not talking about laying on of hands. I mean, we're moving on in the Lord. We're moving on. Hallelujah. So now let's go to Genesis 12. And he tells Abraham, he says, now, verse 1, he says, now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great. See, God will do that. You don't have to try to make your name great. You don't have to wonder about people, what they think about you. What, you, know, you don't have to do that. God said, I'll make his name great. I'll make your name great. I'll make people respect you. I'll make people acknowledge you. You don't have to do it. You don't have to. He told us, James told us, said, man, take the least seat. When you take the least seat, it's better to be asked to come up than it is to be asked to sit back. You know, you go up in the front and then all of a sudden someone of a higher class in the sense of, you know, you're, you're a pastor and you're a district elder or a bishop comes in and you're there in their seat and they ask you, could you let the bishop sit there? It's better that you sit back and allow somebody to bring you up. See, you allow, and all he's saying is it's better to allow God. He said, let God arise. That man, man talked about that. I believe it was Sunday. Hallelujah. Let God arise. And that's what we want to do. We want God to arise in us. I don't have to promote myself. God said promotion cometh not from the east, the west, the north, or the south, but promotion comes from God. And that's all we need is God's promotion. I don't want my own promotion anyway, because if I put myself up, men can take me down. But if God puts me up, I'm up until he say, hallelujah, glory. So he says, uh, verse 2, chapter 12, Genesis, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Your whole life should be a blessing. God blesses you to bless others. He doesn't bless you to hoard. I know most of us have now seen these movies, these shows about hoarding where people got all this stuff in their house and you're like, my, you can't even get in the house. You know, you stepping on top of stuff, stuff they've had for years. And they, you know, and then you see when they start trying to clean up the place, they sit there and like, oh, no, don't do that. No, don't take that. No, that piece is good. You know, you're like, my God, you haven't touched that piece in 20 years, you know, but they hoard. They have a spirit of hoarding, you know, and so we're not hoarders. We're not like that. God said that he will make your name great, He'll that you're going to be a blessing. You're going to be a blessing. Amen. God gives you money 
to be a blessing. God gives you talent to be a blessing. God gives you all of these gifts to be a blessing. What are you doing with your gift? If you're not blessing, amen, somebody else, what are you doing? What are you doing? He gave you the gift to be a blessing. He told Abraham, you're going to be a blessing. He said, I'm going to bless them that bless you and curse him that curse you. And in you shall all the nations or the families of the earth be blessed. And believe it or not, this is still true today. The child of God. We're talking about having the faith of Abraham. The child of God should bless their neighborhood. The child of God should bless their family. The child of God should bless, amen, uh, uh, their relatives. The child of God should bless at their job. People should see something different. People, I mean, you know how some of these pictures you see of Jesus, he got the halo. You know, people should almost see a halo when you walk in the door. You know, they should see something different. But he told Abraham, he said, look, he said, I will bless them that bless you. When you bless others, he's going to bless you. He's going to bless them that bless you. See, somebody called me up today. Oh, such a blessing. Had me, had me in tears. Called me up today, and they just said, I want to bless you. You know, I want to do something for you. And I was like, wow. You know, and, and the young lady told me, uh, I want to do this in honor of my mother who passed away from a heart disease. And, you know, knowing what I've been through with my heart issues. And she said, I want to bless you. And I, I'm just like, wow. But what I also know is that God's going to bless her. See, because when you bless others, you can't help but be blessed. And what the church has done many times and people in the church is we're just the opposite. We feel like we hold it. I was talking about that hoard. We feel that we hold it. I can keep my stuff. I can keep my stuff. God said, give me and I'll give it back to you. Shaking together, pressed down, running over in good measure. I'll give it back to you. But you got to release it. See, people have been hurt. So people don't love anymore. They don't trust people anymore. They've been hurt. But I'm telling you, you got to trust people. You got to love people. Because when you love, God will give it back to you. Doesn't mean that same person is going to be the one that loves you back. But God's going to make somebody, hallelujah, love you. Oh, God, if you only knew the background that I had when I came into the church and there were people around me that cared for me and loved me. I'd never had that before. And I mean, it made a difference. These people, I still remember that day. I'll never forget them. But what, some of them have gone on to be with the Lord and their names ring today as they did then. That took me to the side. That took me and said, man, let me show you something. Let me encourage you in this area and different things. Uh, I, I mean, they blessed me. So now I try to bless others. You know, whether it's with wisdom, whether it's with kindness, whether it's with love, whether it's with mercy. I try not to be a man of judgment all the time because I've been under mercy. See, when you've been through something, then you become a person that understands a little better. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, glory. I feel something in this place. My God, my God. He is so good. So, amen. So, I'll make of thee a blessing. But what I was actually trying to say was that sometimes God calls you out from among certain people. And the reason is, see, uh, you can't get strong around people that's weak. You know, and if you're not strong, you can't help them. So, you have to come aside and God has to strengthen you. And give you and put vital vitamins in your spirit. Hallelujah. Put vitamins that you need. Hallelujah. That make you stronger and stronger so that you can strengthen somebody else. Hallelujah. That's, see, what, so he tells us, come out. Come out from among them. Because you can't help them. See, so you come out, let me help you. Then you can go back and help them. See, it's like an alcoholic. Amen. A person that has been delivered from 
alcoholism. And they come and, and right as they get delivered, they want to go back into the bar. Amen. And witness. And we had one brother, you know, and he wanted to do, I mean, he wanted to help people. And so God had delivered him from alcoholism. And I mean, he was excited about the Lord. And then he was <laughs> Amen. Lord have mercy. <laughs> so he went back into the bar just trying to be a blessing, just trying to help people. And he went back into the bar, and before he knew it, he was already drunk. He wasn't ready for that. See, he needed to come out from among that, you know, and not put himself in that position. Amen. Not put himself back in that position till, you know, it's just like Jesus, what he tell he told Peter. He said, Simon, Simon. He said, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you. And he said, after you're converted, strengthen your brethren. See, after you made it out, after you've been strengthened, after you get what you need, after you become strong and amen, you're able to go back into that environment, but not right away. See, you can't go back right away. You know, and some things you can't go back ever, ever. You can't go back. You can't go back into the crack house if you were on crack. That addiction calls you. God is stronger, but it matters on you. See, it matters on you. You can't go back to the same thing. Scripture says it's just like, it's just like a dog. We turn into his own vomit. Ooh, that sounds gross, but they do it. I've seen, when I read that, I remember dogs doing that. I said, my God, they do that. They throw up and then they go back and eat it up, you know? And when you go back into the things that God has delivered you from, it's like a dog returning to his own vomit. You threw that up. You got rid of that. You moved that out of your way. You were free. You were carefree. You were free. You were like a bird. You were free. You were soaring. And then you went right back to that. Locked yourself back up again. Became bound. Became in bondage. Now you wonder what happened to me. We know. You know what happened to you. So what you got to do is go back as Jesus told the church in the book of Revelation and do your first works over. Go back. See that one thing? There's always redemption in God. That's what I love about him. That's why he said it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. His compassion fails not. They are new every morning. And great is thy faithfulness. That means, honey, I messed up, but I can go back to God and I can get myself together. I may have drawn, I may have uh, went out there and did what I shouldn't have done, but I can come back. Hallelujah. God is not going to turn his back on me. The scripture tells us in Luke where, amen, the prodigal son, as we call him, he went out. He told his father, give me my stuff right now. He said, I want my stuff. He said, I'm going out here. You know, give me my inheritance and all that. And he went out there and the Bible said that he went and he was doing riotous living. He was he was living. He was doing all kinds. He was in the prostitute's home. He was doing crazy things, things he had never done in his life before because he was under the guidance of his father, his heavenly father. But now he left that guidance. He left that sanctuary. He left, amen, being under the provision of God. And he went out there into the world, amen. And then he stopped doing every which thing he could do. And then as he was in there with the, with the pigs and he in the mud with the pigs, because when you leave God and go back to that same old stuff or go back to new stuff, amen, you're in the mud with the pigs. See, you have left grandeur and you have went back to mud. You went back to, deep, to, to darkness. And so he said it came, he, he came to himself. And when he came to himself, he said, you know what? Even the worst person in my father's household is living better than I'm living. I'm going to arise and I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to throw myself down before him and say, forgive me. And that's what he did. And his father, his father's that symbol of God. Oh, the blessedness of God in Christ Jesus. He's that symbol of God. And what he says is he says he sees his son afar off. 
He said, go get the fatty calf. He didn't say, oh, here come that. Ah, he messed up. He should have, you know, stayed here. He didn't say that. He said, I want you to kill the fatty calf. He said, I want you to get everything ready. We're going to have a feast. He said, for my son has returned. And that's the way God is. He said, you have returned. You've come back. You've repented. And I love it. He says, oh, heaven rejoices. Heaven rejoices over one sinner. Heaven rejoices over one saint that comes back. When you say, Lord, forgive me for what I've done, heaven gets happy. See, Jesus gave one parable, and the parable was of, he said there was a publican. And next to the publican, there was a Pharisee. And they both came before God. And the Pharisee said, Lord, I thank you. That I'm not like these other folk. I thank you that I fast three times, you know, every week. I thank you that I pray three times a day. And I thank you that I got myself together and I'm this and I'm that. And it said that the sinner came before God and said, forgive me, have mercy on me. Jesus' words to the people listening was, who do you think was justified before God? And they said to the one of whom God had mercy. See, you can't brag before God. You don't have nothing. I don't have anything to brag about. If I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in the Lord and what he's done. So when you come back, I don't mean when you backslide. I'm talking about today, I, I, you know, I said some things I shouldn't have said. Today, I acted some ways I shouldn't have acted. Lord, forgive me. He says, that's more. Then you become justified by faith. See, because you believe God, that if you ask God, he will forgive you and wash away your sins. Hallelujah. And so you come back to God. Ooh, my God, my God, my God. So sometimes he has to take us away told the disciples, I believe it's in the book of Mark, he said, come ye aside and rest a while. Sometimes you got to come aside. Sometimes our lives are too busy. Sometimes our lives are too busy. Sometimes you got to stop. Say, no, I'm not. To this weekend, I'm going to chill and I'm going to meditate and I'm going to pray and I'm going to get to myself and I want to seek the Lord. While he may be found, I want to seek God this weekend. I want to seek him. I'm not, I don't want to do a whole lot of stuff. I just want to lay before God. We used to have all night prayer. We lay before God all night long. Hallelujah. Calling on his name and just seeking his faith. Amen. We fast. We pray. And we got a fast coming up starting next week, Monday, while I'm, you know, while I'm talking. Starting next Monday. Amen. For the week as we get ready for Pentecost Sunday, which of course is on the 4th of June. And we're going to have a time, a time as we celebrate the birthday. you talking about celebrating your birthday and being lit. And you talking about celebrating your birthday and all that. And what is that? I think they said lit. And then there's another word, amen, that young people say and stuff like that. We're going to celebrate the birthday of the Spirit of God in the church. And the church being born. Hallelujah, on the day of Pentecost. And so, amen, if you get lit on your birthday, amen, if it goes down on your birthday, then it should be going down, amen, on Pentecost Sunday. Hallelujah, we're going to celebrate, you know, and have a good time. Isn't that what the what the, uh, Cool in the Gang said? You know, it's time to celebrate and have a good time, and we're going to celebrate. I know half of y'all don't know who Cool in the Gang is. That's all right. But it's a group back in the 70s, 80s probably, you know. And they sang, they sang that song, Celebrate. So amen for Pentecost. I know that's right. We're going to celebrate the birthday of the church. Amen. Some of us go all out on our birthdays. Some of us go out. I mean, we have a time. We have a time. But we're going to celebrate. Amen. The birthday of the church. And we're going to rejoice. We're going to have communion. We're going to enjoy Jesus 
that day like we never have before because that's what that's why we're here if there's no reason amen if jesus didn't die for us if jesus didn't rise if jesus didn't come to live in our hearts then what are we doing what are we doing what are we going to church for you know we're wasting time but we're not hallelujah we're not wasting time because god is born in us hallelujah hallelujah Woo don't you start nothing because i tell you i'm ready to jump off this chair and run around this building Amen. My spirit is soaring like an eagle because of what God has done. Hallelujah. All right. Well, Doc, come on by if you're in my neck of the woods. Amen. It'd be a blessing to see you. If I don't see you at church, I mean, if I just see you, it'll be a blessing to see you, man. I haven't seen you at least 20 years. So that would definitely be a blessing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. So, amen. As we get ready to wrap this on up, uh, I barely touch. Romans 4, you know, my, 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 my people that, you know, go to our church, they know me, and uh, that happens a lot, and I started off in Romans 4, and I was talking about, amen, us growing by the faith that Abraham had, and I just want to read the scripture, amen, because we kind of jumped around, jumped around uh, Romans, and he says in verse 18, he says, uh, uh, well, let's start earlier than that. We're going to start at uh, 16. I say, therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end of the promise, might be sure to all of the seed, not to only they which is of the law, but to also those which are of faith. Amen. Who is, and Abraham, who is the father of us all. He says, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Then we just read that. Now, it's already come to pass. Now, back there, it had not come to pass. He said, I'll make of thee a great nation. I'll make your name great. I'll make those that bless you. I'll bless them. Those that curse you, I'll curse them. Remember, that was 12th chapter of Genesis. Now, it has happened because the birthday of the church. Amen. And now, uh, we are the engrafted children of God and sons of Abraham. So, now, he says, he says, I would make thee the father of many nations before him whom he believed even God, he believed God, who quickeneth the dead, he makes them alive, and calleth these things that be not as though they were. Now listen to Abraham, who against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. No children, 100 years old, actually 99 years old, still doesn't have any children. He his body, productive-wise, is dead. Sarah's body, productive-wise, is dead. Yet the Bible said he staggered not through unbelief. Staggered not through unbelief. He didn't stagger. He didn't, he, I mean, he didn't hold his tongue and say, I don't know what's going to happen. He stood on the word of God. Amen. He stag that, That's verse 20. I like that. I hadn't got there yet. He says, but he goes on to say, he says, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body that was dead. I just said that. His body was dead. He didn't consider that. He didn't, and that's what God is trying to tell you. Don't look at your circumstances. Look at him. Look at the word of God. Your circumstance don't mean nothing to God. He can change it in the, woo, in the blink of an eye, he can change your circumstance. Doesn't mean anything with God. He staggered not. Holly, I mean, I want you to understand. And see, I sometimes have a time understanding my circumstance doesn't mean anything to God. He can change it just like that. Those of you who have financial problems, God can send somebody and say, I just feel like doing something for you. You know, I saw you one day and, blah, blah, and your whole finance can be cleared up. He can do that. Now, can you believe him for that? Woo! That's what it comes down to. Because that's what Abraham did. Abraham believed God. And we're the children of Abraham. So verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Here's it, here it is. Woo! He staggered not. Oh, God. Not, hallelujah, at the promise. Woo! Has God gave you a promise that is 
absolutely impossible. What did you do with it? <laughs> Abraham staggered not. I believe God. It's going to happen like he said it's going to happen. He's going to bring it to pass. And I know, amen, my body's dead. Sarah's body 